My name is Jeff, uh, and it's my privilege today to take you on a tour of our vault presented by Haggerty, and we're going to show you the history of the Ford Motor Company in a short video, all 117 years of it. You can't do uh, justice to a, a company that's been around that long, but I'll show you some highlights over the next uh, few minutes. Come on in. Ford was incorporated uh, in 1903, making it one of the oldest car companies in the world. And I'm about to show you one of their greatest success stories. And over the course of the tour, we'll talk about some of the other great cars from Ford. But you might be a little bit surprised at this first one. So right here on my left side, and uh, we pulled it out so you can get a good look at it. And I will verify with you in just a moment what car this is. But I'm sure a lot of you already know what it is. And it went into production in 1908. And it was produced for, uh, up until 1927, a relatively brief period of time. And it turns out this is one of the most important cars of the 20th century. It turns out this car is the Ford Model T. Not the A, we'll talk about the difference between the T and the A a little bit later on. Uh, and there's a couple of interesting things to take note of here with the Model T. For example, notice how you started the car with a crank, and that could have been a rather dangerous thing to do if you didn't get your manual settings just right. It might snap back, breaking your arm, your shoulder, even your jaw. Uh, later on, the electric st starter made this thing a little easier, but this is one of the earliest cars, and you could get this car in any color you wanted as long as it was black. And it turns out it could have been a different color than black, but they chose black because it was the most inexpensive uh, paint color at the time, and it dried faster than any other paint, getting the car into the distribution circuit that much faster. And this car is also a Model T. It's just a little bit older. Uh, this one was produced in 1915. Uh, notice the brass trim. The world's earliest cars are known as brass era cars, and this is an example of that. And you'll notice on the driver's uh, door frame there, there's a horn. Notice it's manually operated. There's a plunger at the back of it, and the driver would use his or her hand to push the plunger, and the sound, of course, was auga. And uh, it turns out, too, that this, uh, Ford, these Ford Model T's, 1915 that you're looking at right now, and the 1922 with the hard top on it, uh, was one of the best-selling cars of all time. Uh, in that relatively per short period of time, there was 15 million of these produced. And here's a fact you probably will not believe. Uh, to this day, as we speak, the Model T is still the ninth best-selling car of all time. Only eight other cars have ever outsold the Model T. And I want to make one more mention of the Model T, and I'm going to bring your attention back to this 22 uh, car on the left side, and then we'll be done with this. But take a look at the axle uh, between the two front wheels here, and you'll notice that it's relatively small in size. And one of the reasons why is that they had a, a premium hardened steel called vanadium steel, and Ford was the first to use it back in the day, making the car much lighter and much easier to uh, traverse the roads, which were very bad back in those days. All right, let's go down and uh, head down and take a look at the next uh, major car from Ford. I'm uh, making an attempt to keep these uh, cars in chronological order. I won't be able to entirely do that because of the placement, physical placement of the cars in the vault, but I'm going to attempt to get it approximately in uh, that order. So sometimes on tours that we do here in person at the Peterson, I'll show those cars back there and ask uh, the groups, which model is this Ford? And some people will come up and say it's the Model A. Well, no, it's the Model T. And then the question becomes, well, how did Ford assign the, the letters to these cars? And the short version of this is that Ford would assign a letter of the alphabet to the various projects, uh, development projects inside the company. And if the car went, to, uh, uh, the, uh, went into production, 
then that letter would simply stick with the car. So the Model T, for example, actually replaced the Model N. All right, where are we here? Here we go. The next car I want to show you is the Model A. This car was in production between 1927 and 1931. Uh, so the number produced was a good deal smaller. And what inspired the Model A was the fact that the Model T was aging and competition was catching up with the Model T. And it was Henry Ford's son who convinced him that uh, he needed to come up with a new model. And this is the A. Again, this one's from 1930, the one you're looking at right now. Well, the camera's over there. I want to show you something interesting, too. Notice uh, where the windows would be. There aren't any windows. In fact, you can see that there's no uh, crank for the windows. Uh, this is what, what we call an open touring car, or what Ford and others call the Phaeton. It's a fair weather car. Uh, if it rained, get out of the rain. And also, we talked uh, about the uh, Auga horn on the Model T. It's still here on the Model A, but notice this time it's electrically operated, and you can see the conduit going into uh, the engine compartment there as opposed to being hand operated. While we're standing here, too, I want to bring your attention to something interesting. See that filler cap right there? If I were to ask you the question, what is that for? Well, I've had people on tour say, well, that looks like it would be for water, the radiator. Reasonable answer, but it's not. It's the fuel tank. And what better place to put the fuel tank than between the engine block and the passengers in the car? You're essentially driving a bomb. But th there's a couple of good reasons for why the fuel tank was placed where it was. One is near the engine, and two, it's placed higher than the engine so that gravity could be used uh, to uh, get the fuel into the carburetor. Uh, Henry Ford later on decided that the fuel tank should be uh, put to the back of the car uh, to reduce the accident uh, potential, but by putting the fuel tank in the back like that, it was lower than the fuel tank, which necessitated the development of a new car part. Yes, the fuel pump. All right, this is the Model A. Now, while we're standing here, uh, this is a little bit out of chronological order, but I do want to bring your attention to the cars right next to the Model A. This is an interesting car from 1942, a Ford. It's called the Ford Super Deluxe Station Wagon. Uh, it's large, it's utilitarian, it helped uh, people who owned the car to uh, uh, carry cargo as well as, as uh, passengers. And in 1942, if you remember your world in American history, we were moving into World War II, and the car production stopped right about this period of time so that the steel and other materials could go to the war effort. So this is one of the very last cars that was produced prior to World War II. Notice the wood doors you're standing in front of right now, the wood paneling on the side. There's a couple of good reasons why wood was used. One was the steel was starting to go to the war effort, and also Ford and other car companies found it easier to hire carpenters, people with woodworking skills, more so than uh, steel working skills back in those days. The Woody eventually disappeared. The last one was produced in 1951. By 1952, all steel construction. Okay, that's 1942. Let's head down here and uh, take a look at what's coming up next. Um, now, remember, this is a little bit out of order. The, uh, the uh, Ford Model A is 1930. And what happened after 1930 uh, was the 1932 Ford V8. And that was a particularly popular car. And the hot rods were based on the Roadster version of the uh, 1932s. So you can see this entire row down here. Most of them are the 32 Fords. And one of the most interesting things about the 32 is that it's the first car from Ford to have an eight-cylinder engine. The Model T had the uh, inline four-cylinder with 20 horsepower. Model A had the inline four-cylinder with 40 horsepower. And these uh, Model 32, or the 32 models from 1932, uh, they had a 65 horsepower engine developed at 3,400 RPM called the Flathead V8 engine. All right, so we're not going to be talking about the hot rods here today. That's a topic entirely on its own. 
but I did want to remind you that these hot rods are really based on the 1932 Ford. Now, I want to take you down to a 1935 Ford, which is coming up next, and we're going to see that on the right side. And take a look at this. This was considered quite the beautiful car in 1935. Uh, notice a couple of styling advances from what you had seen before. For example, look at the grill. It's similar to the older Fords, but notice this one is uh, leaning back a bit, uh, giving it a little bit more of an aerodynamic rake. Also, look at the windshield. Uh, this too is leaning back. One of the first cars to have it from Ford, giving it a more modern aerodynamic style. And in 1935, this was c considered a really good looking car. This is a, a piece of the car that we call the radiator mascot. Most people think of that as the hood ornament. And in 1935, this car had 85 horsepower, making it an extraordinarily popular car. It was very, very fast. Americans uh, embraced the car fully. And I wanted to briefly mention to you uh, about a letter that was received by the CEO of the Ford Motor Company in April of 1934. It was handwritten. And uh, basically, the handwritten letter was saying that the car was so impressive and so useful in this particular uh, writer's um, line of work. He said, even though my line of work is not uh, legal, the car is very useful. I love your V8 uh, Ford. And he signed it Clyde Barrow. That sounds familiar to you. Yes, that is Clyde of Bonnie and Clyde. All right, the 35 Ford. Let's uh, bring this up. Uh, if that's the 35, uh, let's go to uh, all the way up to, the, well, actually, let's make, make one mention of the, from the 35, we went to a very interesting car. The war happened now. And then we come back, uh, and in 1940, Ford came out with a brand new design, the 40 Ford. Uh, oh, actually, 1939, when it was, uh, first appeared, uh, 49. Uh, and it was called the Bullet Nose Ford, uh, inspired by the uh, Studebaker um, uh, Bullet Nose. It's not here to be seen right now, but some of you might remember that aerodynamic styling. And that brought Ford into the post-war era. So the next car I do want to show you is a 1954 Ford. That's this uh, red one you see here in front of you. It's called the Crestline. And a number of things that are interesting about this car, it still has a V8 engine, but it's the first car that had a brand new engine after the flathead eight-cylinder engine I told you about that appeared in 1932. So between 1932 and 1953, uh, we had the flathead eight-cylinder. This is the first one with what we call the Y block uh, eight cylinder. And it has uh, 239 cubic inches. And uh, uh, it, 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 the way it uh, looks from the front, if you could see the engine, the two banks of cylinders are designed in such a way that they're angled away from each other. And there's a deep groove in between the two. And the engine from the front looks like the letter Y. So 1954, the first uh, Y block engine from Ford. And also, I wanted to show you an interesting little styling uh, technique. Uh, if you look at the uh, speedometer right here, uh, this was called the Astro Dial. And they essentially gave a translucent uh, panel to the back side of that, which allowed the sun to come in and uh, illuminate the numbers from behind. And uh, it was just an interesting styling technique that was introduced by Ford at the time and uh, helped to sell the cars. Now, while we're standing in this area, uh, the cars are rather closely parked next to each other, but you'll see the car next to it. That's also a 1954 uh, Crestline uh, from Ford. And one of the things that you see here for the first time is that translucent panel uh, right above the driver's side and over the passenger side as well. It's green in color. It'll, it might be hard for you to see it at, at this particular point, but it allowed the sun to come through. And that allowed Ford to call these cars for marketing purposes, the Sunliners. I'm gonna show you a little bit more modern version of this across the way. All right, I'm gonna walk back over on the other side of the aisle here and show you uh, some cars from the 1950s. Now, let's go with this one. 1956, this is the Ford Fairlane. 
And uh, cream color, red, uh, two-tone colors, even three-tone colors were popular in the 1950s from all the car companies. And uh, this Ford, it was called the Fairlane, as you can see here on the front. And Fairlane came from Henry Ford's sprawling estate in Detroit, Michigan. And he called his acreage, his mansion, Fair Lane, two words. He simply put it on the car. Also, we were talking about that translucent panel on that 54 crest line a moment ago. Take a look at uh, this panel right here. There's a kind of a, an attractive chrome uh, uh, bar across the top of the uh, car. And what Ford did with this model in 1956, some of them had this metal removed and that green translucent plastic put in the top, again, giving it uh, 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 the sunlight uh, access into the car. On a personal note, uh, this model is the first car I ever drove. Uh, I didn't even have a legal driver's license at the time, and it did have that green translucent top in it, and to this day, all these years later, I remember how bright and hot it was in there. And that probably was a forerunner to uh, the uh, uh, moon roofs and sun roofs we had many years later. All right, let's head off. This is 1956, so let's head up one year to 1957. In the middle of the 1950s, Ford and Chevrolet were firing on all cylinders and looking really good. Uh, this car has uh, a, a performance. It's a V8 engine again. It can do 120 miles per hour top speed and 0 to 60 in about 10.2 seconds. Now that sounds fairly leisurely to our uh, modern sensibilities, but it was pretty good performance back in the day. And also, I want to show you something all the cameras over here. Uh, take a look at the steering wheel on this 57 Fairlane. And this is what we call a dished steering wheel. And what you want to be looking at right here is notice the uh, horn and the ring is all kind of pushed down. So this is the uh, part that it's most protruding and this is all pushed back. That was a safety feature. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, uh, safety regulators were finding out that people were getting hurt badly in accidents because uh, there were protrusions in the dash or the fact that they were not um, uh, padded. You can see this one is not padded. So by pushing down that center hub, it lessened the possibility of being uh, badly injured. And later on, of course, we had padded uh, uh, dashes. Also, this model was the first American car ever to have what we call a hardtop convertible. It's called the 500 Sundowner. This is not the one. But the hardtop, it looked just like uh, the 57 hardtop, and the trunk lid would come up. The uh, metal uh, top would uh, fold and go into the trunk. It was quite a novelty at the time, but they had a lot of medical, uh, <laughs> mechanical problems with it and eventually uh, put it out of service. All right. Right where you're standing, just rotate around. We're going to show you the next uh, Ford. This is the Ranchero from 1957. And it turns out this is essentially a car that was turned into a pickup truck. And at the time, it seemed like a rather foolish idea until sales were indeed very, very good. And uh, they were so good that Chevrolet had its own version of this car called the El Camino. The Ranchero was capable of carrying 1,100 pounds, uh, not bad. But it raises the interesting question, why did they turn a car into a pickup truck? And rumor has it, it at Ford that it happened by an Australian farmer who contacted the Ford Motor Company and he said, I run a pig farm, I need a pickup truck for my daily farm activities and I need a car to go to church in on Sundays, but I can only afford one vehicle. And that motivated Ford to actually come up with a car-based pickup, the Ranchero. Now, this, uh, this is the great Thunderbird. Um, this is from 1962. It's a little bit out of chronology here, but, and we'll look at earlier Thunderbirds a little bit later on. 1962, this car had a 300 horsepower engine, making it quite a performer. Uh, but it was too expensive for the day, and a lot of people did not buy it. There was only about 2,000 of them ever sold. Uh, but a good-looking car, and while the camera's back there, take a look at the back seat. If you're saying, where's the back seat? Well, the answer is it's under this cover back here. So it looks like a two-seater right here, but this is, in a, th they use a French word called tonneau, uh, and you'll notice there's a little thumb screw right here, and this whole thing lifts off, and you have two uh, full-size back seats back here. This is made out of fiberglass. It only weighs 25 pounds. 
And you've got to ask yourself, why did Ford cover up the back seat? And the answer is it had to do with the nostalgia of the 55, 56, and 57 Thunderbirds, which were the two-seaters. Uh, well, again, a good-looking car, a very fast car, but too expensive for the day. All right, we're going to make our way, uh, oh, while we're standing here, let's take a look at one of the few failures uh, from Ford. This is the Etzel, 1959. Uh, it's called the Corsair, and the only other Etzel back in that period of time was called the Ranger. And the idea um, was to come up with a mid-priced car to compete with uh, the likes of Buick, Oldsmobile, uh, Pontiac, and so on from General Motors. But the car did not do well. Uh, there's a couple, a couple of good reasons for it. One is that there was a recession going on in the United States at the time, and the Etzel turned, about, turned out to be too expensive, and a lot of uh, Americans decided, no, nah, I'll go with a basic Ford at the time. Also, a lot of uh, questions about the styling of the car. So uh, one of the most controversial features of it is here at the front, and when the camera comes back around, you'll see this vertical uh, uh, motif to the grill. A lot of people didn't like it. Um, a lot of people thought it looked like a horse collar, and uh, others had even more uh, unpleasant things to say about it. But whatever the end result was, the car did not sell well, and it was only in production for two years, uh, from 1958 to 1960. The Etzel, if you don't recognize that name, is the name of the only child of Henry Ford and his wife Clara. There was a male child called uh, Etzel. All right, now, what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of pick up our chronology, and I'm going to take you down to uh, the earlier uh, Fords, uh, the uh, Thunderbird, so remember, that's in 1962. I got a nice 1955 Thunderbird. And we're going to make our way across the vault here. And uh, I'll see if I can find a space to uh, get us through these cars. We've got a little bit of a walk to get over there. And uh, so if this was 1959, while we're walking over there, I did want to kind of fill you in on a little history of Ford. In 1960, a car appeared called the Falcon. And it was a little economy car with a small six-cylinder engine, good on, uh, on uh, gas mileage, but a rather dull car. Uh, uh, the Ford company was run by uh, McNamara at the time, who eventually went on and worked in the Kennedy administration. And also in 1960, the Ford Galaxy was introduced, which became a very popular car for Ford. And speaking about the 1960s, let's pause here and take a look at this, this Thunderbird. So the last one you saw was 1962, this one's 1966. And it turns out uh, this car is sitting in a section we call our movie cars. And uh, if you're good at movies and movie at trivia, you could be looking at this green 1966 Ford Thunderbird. And I could ask you the question, what film was this car used in? And if you're contemplating this and not quite sure, uh, I call it a female buddy movie, very, very popular at the time. Yes, this was Thelma and Louise. You might remember they uh, had a suicide pact at the end of the film. They were in deep trouble with the law, and they eventually flew into the Grand Canyon. Uh, this is not the car that went into the Grand Canyon. We're good at restorations here. We're not that good. All right, so the next thing I want to take you to is uh, the car that is one of the most popular cars of all time from Ford. And if you'll sneak through here with me, I'll show you what's coming up next. And while we're walking over there, think to yourself, what is one of the most popular cars from Ford? Well, it turns out the second most popular car ever built by Ford was the Model T. The first one I'll ask you about in just a minute. And the third one is the one you're about to see right now. And that is probably no surprise, the Ford Mustang. Uh, introduced in 1964, and if I were to ask you the question, what was the first year for the American muscle car? I'm sure a lot of people would correctly uh, answer that by saying it was indeed 1964. Question number two, was the Ford Mustang America's first muscle car? Answer, no. Not only not America's first muscle car, but it wasn't a muscle car at all. It was a Ford Falcon with a sporty body on it, sold extraordinarily well, 
but it had uh, about a, a, a small six-cylinder engine in it. It was not for performance. It was a sporty car that the average American could afford. Uh, so it was not a muscle car back then. The muscle car era started up right around uh, 1964. It was done by about 1971. And uh, this one uh, is one of 50 that were made for the second anniversary of the Ford Mustang. And we think uh, in this gorgeous, gorgeous gold color, we think only about five of these survived. So you're looking at a rare and beautiful uh, Ford Mustang. All right, we still have uh, some great cars that we want to show you from Ford. Follow me down this way. And I promise you uh, a, a look at the uh, 1955 Ford uh, Thunderbird. That's what's coming up next. And you might be surprised to hear the origins of the styling of the 55 Thunderbird. You're going to see it down here on the left side. The uh, cream colored one. And the 55 Thunderbird has a particularly interesting story and how it came to pass. And we're well equipped to tell you that story. Here it is, 1955 Ford Thunderbird. It has a 193 horsepower V8 engine back in the day. Uh, not particularly fast. Uh, in fact, the car was not referred to as a sports car. It was referred to as a personal luxury car. And the styling is what really grabbed everybody's attention. Everybody loved the car. And uh, you can see the uh, coloring of the paint colors of the 50s. You see the turquoise interior, the cream color exterior. And I want to show you something interesting. If you're standing, uh, if you can see the car parked next to this one, this is the Ford that we're here to talk about today. That happens to be a Ferrari. And uh, that one's from 1952. It's called the Ferrari Barchetta. And though our task today is not to talk about Ferraris, I do want to talk about that one because that was owned by Henry Ford II back in the early 1950s, sold to him by Enzo Ferrari, and it became the styling inspiration for the Ford Thunderbird. Not that model, that very car. That's the one that was owned by Ford. Take a look at the hood scoops on the Ford Thunderbird. Look where that came from. Look at the egg crate grill on the Thunderbird. Look on the Ferrari, you can see where that styling element came from. Uh, the overall dimensions of the Thunderbird, very much uh, coming from the Ferrari. Now the Ford Thunderbird is no Ferrari, it's certainly not a performance car, but uh, the styling was considered exciting at the time. By the way, this, if you wanted to buy this car today in good shape like that, it would probably cost you about $65,000. Uh, but I can tell you about the sale of one of these cars, uh, it was from 1956, and it sold for $490,000, a spectacular amount of money for a car such as that. Why? It was owned by Marilyn Monroe. So it matters a whole lot who owns these cars and how the value of the car is affected. All right, uh, we're continuing to talk about Ford, so let's move down the line, and we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, well, actually, I want to mention this briefly because this is an interesting little piece of Ford history. Turns out this is a, uh, a Corvette, and uh, we're not here to talk about Corvettes today, but you can see the Corvette uh, badge right here, and the reason why it looks like a Ferrari is because it was designed by Scaglietti in Italy. And what makes this car so interesting is the man who was largely responsible for the design and development of this car at Chevrolet was none other than Carroll Shelby. And when you think of Carroll Shelby, I'm sure you're thinking of Ford. Well, his career actually began at Chevrolet. And because they did not build that car because it was too expensive, uh, that's one of the primary reasons why Carroll Shelby eventually left Ford, uh, uh, well, left Chevrolet and wound up at Ford. Uh, we're going to swing around here and head toward our last two cars. But on the way, I, I want to show you something interesting. This is the great Ford Cobra. It's what we call a continuation car. So it's really a kind of a collection of parts and uh, pieces from various uh, sources. But it gives you uh, the uh, uh, spectacularly beautiful design from um, Carroll Shelby. That's the 427 from 1965. It was based on an uh, English car at the time. And of course, the uh, Cobra has a storied uh, role to play at Ford history, particularly when it comes to performance. And that's how I want to end the tour, uh, taking a look at Ford racing or Ford performance. And it, 
is a very nice thing that we, I can present to you right now. And here's a couple of the modern Ford GTs right here on my right side. And um, if you've seen the popular film, which is on the market right now, called Ford versus Ferrari, you're familiar with the fact that um, Ford was attempting to win the prestigious uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans race back in the 1960s, and were constantly being shut out, as was everyone else, by Ferrari. Ferrari won in 1960, 61, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Henry Ford was so frustrated by this uh, series of events that he tried to buy the Ferrari company and nearly pulled it off, but in the end, he was, the deal fell through and he had uh, uh, to develop a Le Mans competitive car at Ford on his own. They spent many millions of dollars attempting to develop it. It's called the GT40. Uh, that's not uh, visible here at the moment. Uh, it is available on our third floor when the museum reopens. You can see it up there, uh, 40 inches off the ground. And Ford did manage to win Le Mans in 1966 and 67, 68, and 69. It was a stunning uh, outcome for Ford, and to this day, the GT40 is the only American-designed uh, and built race car that has ever won Le Mans. All right, that was the first generation. This is the second, I call it the second generation. This is actually a, uh, a uh, performance car which is available to the general public, theoretically at least. Uh, it's from 2006, and uh, it is capable of over 200 miles per hour, 208 miles per hour top speed. And uh, it was uh, made available for sale at approximately $185,000. Now, $185,000 back in 2006, you should have bought the car. And if you had, you probably could sell this version now for up to $450,000. A spectacularly good looking car. Uh, it's one of my favorite cars in the entire vault. Uh, I've never driven it, I'm sure I never will. Uh, this is the red one that uh, you saw a moment ago. That's the latest generation from Ford, the GT, and it was developed at, in Detroit, and it was released in uh, 2016 and raced at Le Mans that year, and it won first, third, fourth, and ninth places in its class. Uh, congratulations to Ford. They're still getting the job done, and it turns out this one has a six-cylinder Eco Boost engine. There, you can't even put an eight cylinder engine in this car. And notice the air scoops everywhere you look. In fact, it even pushes in on the uh, passenger compartment so the uh, air scoops on either side can be drawing in as much air as possible. Well, there you have it. That is the uh, uh, very quick 100 year history of the Ford Motor Company here at the uh, Peterson Vault. And uh, when the museum reopens, come back and see us uh, in person, and uh, we'll give you a tour here at the uh, Peterson right here in the vault, and I or one, one of my colleagues will take you through, and we'll not only give you more detail on the history of Ford, but uh, all the other cars that you see all around you. And there you have it. My name is Jeff. I hope to see you again next time online or here at, in person at the Peterson Automotive 